For the past few years, the world of space exploration has been all about Mars. But before that, Venus was actually the key planet everyone had their sights set on. At the end of the Cold War, the space race was at its peak between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and in that, leaps were made in discoveries. Convergence to what has now become these really dramatically different worlds. While the Soviets made a lot of the information about their findings public, turns out there were details that they opted to keep to themselves. Join us as we dig deeper into the shocking discovery on Venus that the Soviets kept hidden, and how it could the course of space exploration forever. It all started with a little beep from the great beyond. In 1957, the Soviet Union shocked the world by launching Sputnik, the first ever artificial satellite. Suddenly, space exploration became the one thing the great powers wanted to excel at. Both the United States and the Soviet Union were determined to prove their scientific prowess and global dominance. It was a race to the stars, and the stakes were higher than ever. The Soviet Union, in particular, was keen to show off its superior technological know-how, and what better way to do that than to set its sights on Venus? At the time, it was the perfect target. It's a planet that's not only close to Earth, but also has a similar size and composition. Everyone called it Earth's sister planet. The thing is, that was just based on the size. Was it really like Earth in any way? Could it really be Earth 2.0? These were questions the whole world was asking, and the Soviets decided that they were going to get the answers. But it wasn't going to be an easy feat. Venus was known for its incredibly harsh conditions. Scorching hot temperatures, thick clouds of sulfuric acid, and crushing atmospheric pressure that could crush a human being like a pancake. But the Soviet Union was undeterred. They had a plan, and it involved sending a spacecraft to Venus. It was a bold move, to say the least. But it was the start of the Venera missions. The spacecraft, named Venera 1, was launched in 1961. But unfortunately, it didn't quite make it to Venus. It flew past the planet, missing it by a whopping 62,000 miles. But the Soviet Union didn't give up. They sent another spacecraft, Venera 2, in 1962, but it too fell short and didn't make it to the planet. But they say the third time's a charm, right? The Soviet Union launched Venera 3 in 1965, and this time, it actually made it to Venus. Sort of. The spacecraft crash-landed on the planet's surface, but it still managed to transmit data for a few minutes before it was destroyed by the intense conditions. From this point on, they knew that if they wanted the spacecrafts to actually be useful in sending back information, they needed to step up their game. So they did a bit of redesigning. The newer probes weighed about 2,000 pounds and carried equipment and a detachable pod known as a descent module. The descent module was outfitted with a second set of instrumentation, such as a barometer, radar altimeter, gas analyzers, and thermometers, allowing them to collect as much data as possible, even if they were to just survive for a few minutes once they landed. Venera 4 was one of those probes. It not only made it to the surface, in fact, but it also discovered very high quantities of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This was a significant finding because it helped us understand more about the planet's geology and climate. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, meaning it traps heat in the atmosphere, leading to a warming effect. The high levels of carbon dioxide on Venus contribute to the planet's extremely high surface temperatures, which can reach up to 864 degrees Fahrenheit. Understanding the composition of Venus's atmosphere is crucial in understanding the planet's climate and how it evolved over time. Considering Venus and Earth are so similar, this could potentially give us a glimpse into what might eventually happen to the Earth, too. But that wasn't all. In addition to all of that, the probe also found that the planet didn't have a worldwide magnetic field. The Earth has a strong magnetic field that protects us from harmful solar winds and radiation. Without this protection, life as we know it would not exist. The absence of a similar magnetic field on Venus suggests that the planet may not be capable of supporting life as we know it. It also helps us better understand the formation and evolution of planetary magnetic fields, which is important in understanding the history and potential habitability of other planets in our solar system and beyond. Sadly, after roughly 90 minutes of gathering measurements, Venera 4 gently drifted down into Venus's thick atmosphere, where it met its death due to the planet's extreme heat and pressure. 
Venera 5 and Venera 6 were also successful, sending data for more than 50 minutes when they parachuted into Venus's atmosphere in 1969. By assisting scientists in further characterizing the world's atmospheric composition, these probes demonstrated that Venus is exceedingly improbable to harbor life. The hopes of Venus as an Earth alternatives were smashed. But even then, there were just more and more questions. So more probes had to be sent to make sense of everything. Subsequent flights, such as Venera 7 and Venera 8, successfully landed on Venus and transmitted data back to Earth. These missions produced important information on the planet's atmosphere and surface conditions, including severe temperatures and pressures. Venera 7 had an even more ambitious descent module meant to land softly on Venus, complete with substantial defense to withstand the harsh conditions on the surface. Initially, it failed, although it managed to relay essential data for a brief time. The lander registered a surface temperature of over 900 degrees Fahrenheit, despite the failure of the probe's pressure sensor during descent. Researchers were able to estimate a surface pressure of around 92 bars. Venera 8 replicated most of the Venera 7 mission in 1972, but without the lander collapsing on the surface of Venus. Venera 8 was outfitted with equipment for studying Venus's atmosphere and surface. The spaceship carried a lander meant to descend through Venus's dense atmosphere and land on the planet's surface. The lander fell smoothly through the atmosphere and settled on the surface, sending data back to Earth for nearly an hour until its batteries died. Here, you can see the progression clearly. Every time something went wrong, the Soviets learned from it. They'd tweak the next phase of the mission accordingly and fix the last problem, even if that meant that they'll just encounter more problems with the future spacecraft. It was constantly going from one to the other. According to the data returned by Venera 8, the air pressure on Venus was around 90 times that of Earth's atmosphere at sea level. The Venera 8's working pressure sensor verified Venus's oppressive atmosphere. Still, it also measured ambient light levels on the surface, indicating that future cameras should be able to record the Venusian sites. You see, the Soviet Union wasn't content with just landing on Venus. They wanted to see it up close and personal. That's where Venera 9 through Venera 12 come in. These probes carried cameras capable of directly imaging the planet, giving us our first glimpse of the rugged, rocky, alien terrain. The early images were a little rough around the edges, but they still revealed vast expanses of harsh environments, complete with impact craters, steep elevations, and lava-flooded basins. Venera 13 and 14, launched in 1981, were even more advanced than their predecessors. They carried landers outfitted with sophisticated acoustic equipment that could measure the speed of the Venusian wind. But the real stars of the show were Venera 15 and 16, which replaced the landers with powerful radar-based imaging equipment capable of mapping Venus from eccentric orbits. They gave us around a mile per pixel resolution and detailed photographs of Venus's surface, exposing its geology and conditions. We were finally able to get a true look at Venus, and the information just kept getting better and better. Sure, many cameras failed on these probes, but a few managed to capture and send back the first photographs from the surface of our solar system's second planet. Despite all their efforts, the Venera probes couldn't find any signs of life on Venus. There are no oceans, no lakes, not even a drop of water on this barren planet. But their research has helped us understand more about the extreme environments of other planets and how they differ from Earth. While that's a little disappointing, there was more information these probes found. The Venera 13 probe captured the sounds of the Venusian wind, making history as the first recording of any sound on a planet other than Earth. But that's not all the Venera 13 was able to accomplish. The lander, designed to operate for only 45 minutes on the surface, ended up exceeding expectations and lasted a whopping 127 minutes. During that time, it captured and sent back stunning color photos of the planet's surface, revealing a harsh and barren landscape, unlike anything we've seen before. But that's not all, folks. Venera 13 also did some digging and analyzed a sample of Venus's soil, or regolith. This analysis provided us with valuable insights into the planet's composition and geology including the presence of materials like titanium and iron. 
It's incredible to think that we were able to learn so much about a planet over 100 million kilometers away from us. That too in the 1980s. But with the detailed findings, it was clear that Venus is a no-go zone for life as we know it. With an atmosphere nearly 100 times thicker than Earth's and scorching surface temperatures, it's safe to say that Venus isn't exactly a tropical paradise. Plus, unlike Earth and the other planets, Venus rotates backward and doesn't have life or seas of water like our blue planet. Despite this, we're not done with Venus just yet. Russia's state space organization, Roscosmos, is designing a new Venera mission called Venera D, set to launch in 2029. This mission will feature an orbiter and a lander, and will serve as a model for future Venus missions. Now you might be wondering why? When we already know that Venus can't exactly support life, why would Russia want to go out of its way to explore the planet again? Well, turns out, they weren't fully forthcoming about everything they found on the planet. In early September of 2020, researchers from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology announced that they had detected phosphine gas in the atmosphere of Venus, a potential sign of life. Now archived data from a NASA mission to Venus in 1978 may provide additional evidence to support this claim. The Pioneer Venus multi-probe mission dropped four probes into the planet's atmosphere in December of 1978. The largest of these probes contained an instrument called the Large Probe Neutral Mass Spectrometer, which was used to identify molecules in the atmosphere by measuring their speed as they hit a detector. While the instrument was primarily used to measure molecules like carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and argon that were known to be present in the Venusian atmosphere, the sensitivity of the LNMS may have allowed it to detect other molecules as well, including phosphine. Rakesh Mogul, a professor of biological chemistry at California State Polytechnic University, Pomona, who recently reanalyzed data from the LNMS, said, We were able to extract some data from the literature from about 40 years ago, and we think we're able to identify some interesting things. We believe that the evidence suggests the presence of phosphine. Mogul suspects that scientists on the original mission may have overlooked the presence of phosphine in their initial analysis of the data because they were primarily focused on the bulk properties of the atmosphere. Or they just didn't make the information public so no one else would know but them. Having the information hidden would give them an edge. While the U.S. and the rest of the world focused on Mars and the rest of the solar system, they were possibly digging deeper into the data collected from Venus. Now, things aren't really as simple as just finding an overlooked detail here. If Mogul's interpretation of the Pioneer data is correct, it would provide rapid verification of the recent detection of phosphine by the MIT team. However, not everyone is convinced that the LNMS was sensitive enough to detect phosphine. Planetary scientist Mikhail Zolotov of Arizona State University argues that the LNMS data may have detected a mixture of phosphorus-rich gases and hydrogen sulfide instead of phosphine. If the LNMS did detect phosphine, it would suggest a much higher abundance of the gas than what was found by the MIT team, which is a major red flag in itself. Unfortunately, the data from the Pioneer Venus multiprobe mission is currently archived on microfilm at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and access to the archive is restricted right now, so no one can gain access to it. David Williams, the acting head of the NASA Space Science Data Coordinated Archive, says that they are currently trying to get permission to digitize the microfilm. That way they can study the data in detail without having to keep the physical data with them. This discovery was exciting because phosphine can be produced by living organisms and as such raised the possibility of the existence of life on Venus. However, it is important to note that this discovery is not conclusive evidence of life on the planet. Not yet, anyway. To confirm the presence of phosphine on Venus, additional data needs to be collected. This can be done by sending atmospheric probes that can directly detect the gas or by analyzing archived data from past missions to Venus. By collecting more data and analyzing it thoroughly, scientists can verify the presence of phosphine and determine whether it is being produced by living organisms or through non-biological processes. It is crucial to confirm these findings because the possibility of life on another planet is a groundbreaking discovery that could change our understanding of the universe and our place in it. At the same time, though, 
it's important to ensure that the data is accurate and reliable before making such claims. So scientists will continue to explore and analyze data from Venus in the hopes of confirming the presence of phosphine and discovering other potential signs of life on the planet. If they do, it might just change the course of the way space exploration works. All focus might once again be on Venus, and we might finally get evidence of an Earth 2.0. Do you think Venus could be it? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, and we'll see you guys in the next one.